and today we're going to have a lecture video on the introduction to para parasitology. And when I had this uh, preparation for the lecture, I remembered one movie last 2020 called The Movie Parasite. This is a South Korean film featuring two families, actually three families, but uh, the main families are Families here are the Kim's family. So the Kim's family is a poor family who is living in the base in a basement. They work for a family called the Parks family, a very wealthy family who lives in a very, very uh, large and huge mansion. So here, the relationship between the two families, we can see here that uh, it's not a, it's a symbiotic relationship initially as form, but then um in the storyline later on, we will, re we will learn that there's another family who is living in a far lower portion of the basement. So in South Korea, a uh, class of the society is being seen by how high you are above the ground or how much sunlight you see at your home. So we start yung, yung movie na to with the Kim's family in the basement and then sakto magkakaroon ng sunrise and then makikita natin doon na very much or little sunlight or walang direct sunlight silang nakikita. So, uh, while well, the Parks family has a very huge mansion with glass doors and glass windows, even glass walls where you can see much of the sunlight. So, we can see the class difference and also greed and discrimination is seen in this movie. So, but why was it entitled Parasite? Because we will learn later on what what parasitology is and how a parasite benefit from its host. And what is um, peculiar about this movie is we will learn later on on the part of the movie that... There's another family that is living in the basement of the house of the Parks family, which is very, very low. So doon natin makikita yung society or class um, society sa South Korea. So it's a very interesting movie. I recommend it. But uh, yeah, I just remembered it when I was preparing for this lecture. So anyway, let's talk about parasitology. When we talk about the word parasite, this is an organism that lives inside or uh, on another organism to the detriment of the host organism. So, ibig sabihin, they grow, they feed, or use shelter of the host organism, contributing negatively to the relationship. So, later on, in the movie, uh, i-compare ko lang, uh, later on in the movie, makikita natin that the Kim's family, uh, they did not introduce themselves as a family to the Parks family. Ibig sabihin, nag Sila. They employed themselves individually, not saying that they are just one family who's living in, uh, who's going to work inside the house. So, yung father nila naging driver, yung mother naging katulong, yung anak nila na dalawa naging tutors so, ng mga anak ng Parks family. So, makikita natin how are they are benefiting from the host family or from the Parks family. On the other hand, later on in the movie, makikita mo na ang Parks family are you just cannot consider them as the host, but para rin silang parasites because they grow or they become rich by uh, using the uh, cheap labor of the poor people in the community. So, ganun naman sila nag-benefit from the relationship. So, anyway, let's go back to the word parasite. So, that is what a parasite is. When you remember in grade school, pag, and pag humihingi kayo ng paper sa classmate nyo, di ba? Parang sasabi nyo, ay parasite talaga ito, hindi ka nang hiniparate, wala kang sariling papel. Okay. Now, when we talk about parasitism, it is a symbiotic relationship in which the symbiote, symbiont or the parasite benefits from the host. So, either they live within the host, yun yung tinatawag nating endoparasite, so they, like for example, this one, and then or outside the host, which we call ectoparasite. So ecto is outside, endo inside. So the letter N will remind you of that. Indo, so endo, in. Okay, so there are different types of parasitism. So when we talk about obligate parasites, almost all of their life cycle are parasitic. So meaning they cannot really... Uh, um, they cannot survive without their host. So most of their lives, they should be uh, in the in the 
uh, presence of the host. When we talk about temporary parasites, just for a limited period of time, when they are already feeding or when they are trying to reproduce, dun lang sila nagiging parasites. So we call that temporary. Facultative parasites are, are, on the other hand, they are not parasitic, but they can live parasitic for a limited period. So hindi talaga sila parasitic unlike those of obligate and temporary parasites. And accidental parasites, they are normally free-living organisms. They can survive uh, within a host when they are accidentally taken. So that's why they are called accidentally accidental parasites. Parasite host, on the other hand, is the organism where these parasites live in. So they can be uh, termed as definitive, intermediate, parathenic, or reservoir. So let's try to differentiate those. So when we say definitive host versus intermediate host, these are the differences. So in this table, we can see here, definitive hosts are organisms that support the sexual reproductive form of the parasites, while intermediate hosts are organisms that support the immature or non-reproductive forms of parasites. Now, when we say definitive, definitive hosts, we call them primary hosts. When we say intermediate, they are called secondary hosts. Now, for the definitive host, sexual reproduction of the parasite will occur on this host. Uh, they form the zygotes. This is where the formation of zygotes will occur kasi nga, di ba, sexual reproduction. And an example of this is the plasmod plasmodium. Host of plasmodium is the female Anopheles mosquito. So going back on intermediate host, a sexual reproduction of the parasite will occur here and sexual differentiation will also occur. An example would be the intermediate host of plasmodium is human. So the definitive host is the mosquito, while the intermediate host is the human, meaning uh, a sexual reproduction will occur on the intermediate host, while sexual reproduction will occur on the definitive host. So that's a very good example. Now, what do we mean when we say reservoir hosts? So with respect to human parasites, they, they are hosts that are infected with a parasite and they keep it alive, even if the parasite is swiped wipe out in humans. So they can spread the parasite and reintroduce it to human population. That's why it's called reservoir. So when we thought that it's already wiped out, if we still have reservoir hosts, pwede may balik yung parasites na ito. Parathenic host, on the other hand, is an organism that is infected with a parasite and can pass it on to another ho host which in which the parasite does not develop further. So, naipapasa niya ito, but even though naipasa niya siya, this parasite will not develop further. For example, the larval stage survives but does not develop further. That is a parathenic host. Now, symbiosis is a biological relationship between two species. They live in close proximity to each other, they interact, and... Uh, as a, a way is for them to benefit one or both of the organism. And there are different types of symbiosis. When we say uh, types, we have three principal varieties. We have mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Let's start with mutualism. Okay. So when we talk about mutualism, this is a relationship between two species of organism that benefits both species. Aww. Ganda, di ba? Both of them benefits from the relationship, di ba? Sabay-sabay uh, natin sabihin, sana all, di ba? Kasi di, both of them will benefit. Hindi pa dapat ganun lahat ng mga relationships, sana. Um, if you're in a relationship, for example, um, this bee and the flower, they benefit from each other. So, sana lahat ng relationship ganito, di ba? But in sana ako pa rin. Ako na lang. In reality class, not every relationship is, is, is this way. That's why we really have to find someone to have relationship with na mutual, wherein both of you will benefit. I found a love for Kaya galingan natin, class, okay? Now, another type of symbiosis is commensalism. In this relationship, one organism, which we call the commensal, benefits but it does not cause any harm or detriment to the other organism, which is the host. 
Okay? So, nagbe-benefit siya, pero at least hindi niya hinaharm. It does not cause any harm to the other uh, partner in the relationship. So, that is commensalism. So, very good pa rin naman siya. Like, papano? Well, parasitism, here, one organism which is called the parasite will benefit at the expense of the other organism which is the host. So, for example, here, a mosquito. So, yan ang parasitism class. These are the three types of symbiosis. Now, um, when we are trying to study the parasites, we have to understand what the difference of a trophozoite is to a cyst. Trophozoite, as we can see in this picture, this is a moving, feeding, and multiplying stage of protozoan life cycles. Um, there are not male and female trophozoites. They multipa- multiply asexually. So as we can see here, motel siya. So look at the structure. So... While cysts, on the other hand, is the stage of many protozoan parasites that survives well in the environment. So cysts of human parasites are infective to humans. So as we can see, this is how a cyst looks like. Now, um, there are different stages in the life cycle of a parasite. So we have the infective stage, which is also known as the invasive stage. So this is stage of the parasite. Uh, is the one that invades the hosts. So, infective stage. Dito na kukuha ng host yung parasite na yun. When we say vector, on the other hand, this is an arthropod which is carrying and transferring parasites from one host to another. Example nito, uh, yung egg uh, will develop into its larval stages and then will develop into an adult parasite and then magkakaroon ulit siya ng egg. So, they carry or transfer these parasites from host to host. Reserva, these are non-human hosts where the parasite can live. So, remember the reserva type of host. It's only applied when the parasite can infect humans. And life cycle, these are the stages of development of a parasite. So, these terms are very important to remember. Now, uh, what you need to know are the essential features of a par- parasitism. So how, how will you say that a certain organism is a parasite? These parasites are smaller, has a shorter lifespan, and has a greater reproductive potential than its host. So that are the fe- those are the features that you have to remember. Now, these parasites can have different um, places to live. So some live in the digestive system. So for example, these uh, solozoic parasites or tapeworms. So through an endoscopy, we have seen this inside the uh, intestines. There are some parasites living in the blood. We call them hemoparasites. An example would be Fabicia. And some parasites that live in tissues. So we call those histozoic parasites. An example would be pichineliosis. Okay. So, uh, we'll know that parasites really can live everywhere. So, makikita natin dito. Methods of invasion and escape. So, there are different methods for invasion. You can use vectors. Okay, pwede ding oral route kapag through eating or sometimes when we put something in our mouth. And then penetration from the skin. So, if we have wound, we can penetrate or invade the human host. Um, they escape through the sputum. For example, the parasite is from the um, lungs. Okay, they escape through the sputum, also via vectors, feces, or urine. That's why you will learn later on at the end of this lecture that the specimen that we are getting for um, detection or diagnosis of these parasites are stool, urine, and the blood majority. Okay, so pathologic effects of parasites will include Physical trauma in the skin or mucosa. Uh, migration, meaning um, it will not only affect one body organ, but they may migrate to another parts of the body or another organs in the body. And another is nutrition. Of course, since they will be living inside the host, they will feed from the host. This will affect the nutrition of the host. So malnutrition could be seen. Or um, mineral deficiency and vitamin deficiencies as well. Toxins, it could be it could have a toxic effect on the body and of course immunosuppression. 
In diagnosing a parasitic infection, so we have both clinical and laboratory diagnosis. So there are different methods to study and to do clinical analysis. And what we're going to discuss on this lecture video are very general concepts because um, these types of laboratory diagnosis or clinical diagnosis will be discussed individually when we're going to discuss the different uh, parasites. So when we talk about uh, methods, we have para parasitological analysis, we use tissue samples, excrement, sur and surgical methods such as biopsy. Radiological as well, so we can use um, x-ray and other methods or other diagnostic tools. So we have your rentgenoscopy tomography, and of course, serodiagnostics, so immunodiagnostics, ELISA tests, and other methods. Now, what is life cycle? So this is another term that you will encounter in a lot of parasites that we're going to study. So when we talk about life cycle, this will include the ontogenesis, development and reproduction of the parasite. From the various phases of its life history, it will encompass both parasitic and non-parasitic stages. And for us to uh, fully understand the life cycle, um, the key to understanding its transmission of the parasite species and par parasitic disease is the life cycle. So we will know what is the infective stage, what is the diagnostic stage, and um, what are the specimens that we can get, and how are we going to stop the transmission. So once you understand its life cycle, you will then learn or you will then know how to stop the transmission of that parasite. So these are the stages of a life cycle. We have when we talk about the stage that the parasite is in the human host, we call that pathogenesis. This is the time that the human will develop symptoms because of the effect of that certain parasite in the body. So that's pathogenesis. And this one, it has to be explained very well when we are going to discuss the different types of parasites. So when the human host will be discharging this parasite, we now call this the diagnostic stage. For example, if it is being discharged through the feces, then we will be uh, getting the stool as a specimen to check if the um, parasite is there. Next would be the stage developing outside the human host. This is what we call the stage of transmission. Because once they are developed outside the human host, then it means they will have the ability to infect another human. So, and now the last stage would be the large, uh, the infective stage wherein they can infect another human host. So as we can see here in this picture, we'll start with uh, the figure here in number one. If you see this um, picture of a microscope or an icon of the microscope, this is the diagnostic stage. Well, this icon represents the infective stage. So as we can see here on the diagnostic stage, we have here... Um, adult Ascaris lumbricoides found in the small intestine. This will then be discharged as could be an uh, unfertilized egg that will not undergo further development or a fertilized egg. So through the feces, so we will get a stool specimen to diagnose it. So now here comes, this is what we call the discharge stage. Now here comes the development that occurs outside the human host, which we call the transmission stage. So as you can see, the fertilized egg has been multiplying. So nagkakaroon siya ng mitosis. And mo multiply yung, um, uh, it multiplies the embryonated egg. So as we can see here, uh, nagkakaroon na tayo ng embryonated egg with L3 larva. And then this will be, uh, upon ingestion of the embryonated eggs, this now will come become your infective stage. So after that, the heart hatch larva will enter the circulation and migrate to the lungs. So upon, my, and upon entering the circulation in the intestine, it will migrate going to the lungs. And then the larva are coughed up and swallowed, re-entering naman the gastrointestinal tract. So maturation proceeds in the small intestine. So this is the life cycle of an Ascaris lumbricoides. And um, when you're going to understand or study each parasite, you have to understand your life cycle. So this picture from the Center for Disease Control 
uh, napakagandang gamitin natin when trying to understand the different parasites. So we have different modes of infection. Uh, filth-borne or contaminative. So this is you know, medyo lack of personal hygiene, medyo dubiot, ano? and community sanitation. Ibig sabihin, one of the interventions that could be done is to really clean up. Diba? So personal hygiene should be improved and of course, sanitation in the community should be improved as well. So infectious stage remain viable for long periods in a contaminated soil. We also have soil or water-borne uh, modes of infection. So water or dirt which can contain the eggs may cause transmission. The larva can penetrate skin even if your skin is intact but if you have bare feet, we may enter the skin through an infested water. Also is foodborne, inadequately cooked, whether that's beef, pork, fish, shellfish, so it could be foodborne. And arthropod, arthropod born, the most of difficult of all to control, example, those mosquitoes na nagtartransmit ng malaria, so it's the most difficult to control. Now, in the collection, processing, and examination of specimens, we have different um, uh, gadgets that we can use. So first, we have the microscope. The objectives must be calibrated in order to ensure accurate measurement of microorganisms or organisms. So it must be well calibrated. So class, when I see a microscope, means I'm trauma ako because I remember the times when we had our exams in laboratory. Uh, talaga namang, uh, it's one of the most challenging parts that I had when I was a medical student. Kasi hirap na hirap ako. I was a nurse prior to become becoming a doctor and I did not have much experience on uh, using the microscope. Although we did, but uh, not so much that uh, we are trying to identify uh, very small parts and then they will be asking like four questions in one microscope. And then that's gonna be just for 16 seconds. And then pupunta ka na naman sa isang microscope. So first question pa lang class, ay wala na akong masagot dun sa four questions. And then mag ring na yung bell and then next na. Kaya medyo traumatic yung experience. At saka ito nga yung may pinakamababang score na nakuha ako nun sa med school. 7 out of 50, di ba? Miyak ako. I mean, pagkarating ko sa bahay, parang mangyak-miyak ako kasi 7 over 50 for the first time in my life ang baba nang nakuha ko sa exam. But, uh, you know, after that, na-realize ko kasi tinanong ko yung ibang classmates ko, ganun din pala halos yung score nila. So, may 10 over 50, 5 over 50. Kaya, naging happy na rin ako class. So, anyway, ayan. So, microscope. Next, we have centrifuges. So here we can see a swinging bucket type centrifuge. So makikita natin, um, we, we are also use this in one of our experiments in med school, but really I'm not so uh, familiar with how to use these um, machines. Okay, now what are the types of specimens which can be examined for diagnosis of the parasites? So we have your natural secretion. So feces, sputum, urine. Um, they detect lumen-dwelling parasites of the gastrointestinal tract, even pulmonary and genitourinary tracts. Yeah. So blood, uh, this is the usual specimen for detection of blood and tissue parasites. And also we can use biopsies and aspirates as well. Now, intestinal dwelling parasites, so we use fecal specimens. So why are we trying to understand this? I know we are not go as doctors, we will not be the one to process this specimen unless we become a pathologist, diba? we can do this. But of course, why do we want to understand or know about this? Because as doctors, we will be the one to explain to the patients what procedures or what type of specimens will be collected. And we will help in explaining to them how it will be collected. So we have to prepare the patient. They, may, they must avoid substances substances which can interfere with stool exam. So what are those? We have antimicrobials. They should not be taken 10 days prior to collecting the specimen. So what are these examples? So we have bismuth, barium, mineral oil, and other drugs. So such as antidiarrheal preparations or lactacid. Lac laxatives, not lactacid class. Laxatives. Okay, ibang iba yun mali. 
Alright, contaminant-free specimens, of course, dapat malinis yung specimen cup, you have to check it. No urine, water, or dirt as this may destroy the organisms and may be confusing. Because if they contain free living organisms, that will also be seen upon examination. Now, there are different types of stool specimens. So, sa mga kumakain, yan, medyo mamaya nyo na lang ituloy. Ano? So, liquid specimens, um, why do we uh, want the liquid specimens, liquid stool specimens? These are where the trophozoite stages are most likely to be present. So, trophozoite ang makikita natin. So, for procedures, uh, we will use direct wet mounts for detecting motility. So, take note of that. For wet mount, this is for detecting motility. Permanent stains exhibit the best morphology. They must be examined within 30 minutes of passage or placed into an appropriate preservative. So, of course, um, yan ang dapat natin malaman na hindi pwedeng magtagal yung specimen without the appropriate preservative to be used. Uh, freshly passed specimens are necessary in order to recover the motile trophozoites. Now, in cyst formation, it will not occur once the organism is already outside the body. So, trophozoite will disintegrate rapidly after passage. This is the reason why it must be examined within 30 minutes already, especially if we don't have any preservatives for it. We also have what we call classier formed specimens. So, as you can see, formed specimens, this is where we see the cyst. So, as you can see here, the triangle, inverted triangle, meaning majority of the cyst will be seen in a formed specimen. So, cyst of protozoa, cyst of large lar eggs and larvae of helminths may be present. So, direct wet mounts will serve to detect those organisms which do not concentrate well. Semi-farm specimen here, uh, or soft specimen, all stages may be present. So you can see cysts and trophozoites on this stage. And uh, one should perform all procedures like direct examination, concentration, acid pass, and permanent stain on a semi-farm specimen. Okay. Now, um, for the collection of this specimen, this must be submitted uh, directly to the lab. And as I mentioned earlier, it must be examined within 30 minutes to one hour. If not, they should be stored properly or refrigerated in order for us to prevent it from being destroyed. Hindi na natin madadiagnose or detect properly. Commercially prepared preservation kits, uh, if not able to examine within 30 minutes, this should be used for us to make sure the, of the integrity of the specimen that we have collected. Now, there are fixatives and preservatives uh, that you also have to know. So, you have to have an ideal preservative for us to preserve all the diagnostic stages. And of course, uh, it should not interfere with the concentration and staining techniques. Now, um, if it cannot be processed immediately, at least prepare a slide for permanent staining on the day it is received. That it can be stained during the next workday, avoiding delaying results. So what are these commonly used preservatives? So we have your MIF or merthiolate iodine formalin. So this is used for wet smear and concentration only. It cannot be used for staining permanently. Um, SAF or SAF, this is sodium acetate, acetic acid. It is used naman for concentration. Uh, and it can also stain permanently with iron and hemotoxylin only. And trichrome, will, a stain will not produce satisfactory results. So these are commonly used preservatives. Sa mga medtechs, madali lang siguro sa inyo to because you're using it, right? So we also have PVA or polyvinyl alcohol or formalin kit. This is a, a popular method which uses two vials. So first vial is a 5 to 10% formalin. It can preserve your helminth eggs and larvae, protozoan cysts. It cannot be used for direct wet mounts and in a concentration procedure. The second vial, on the other hand, we call that your polyvinyl alcohol fixative, or this one. Um, it preserves protozoan trophozytes and even cysts, and it can be used for permanent staining. Um, in PBA, there are, are a variety of fixing agents such as mercury, zinc, and copper, but zinc is the best alternative 
to Mercury, which remains to be the gold standard. So, Mercury is the gold standard. Zinc ang best alternative natin. Alright, so we also have other uh, preservatives. So, dami no. Um, you don't really have to memorize all of this, but I just also want you to understand that there are, these are the things that we use. And as a doctor later on, you also have to be aware of this. So, we also have your Shodin's fixative. It is used for staining fresh specimens and it contains mercury. 10% uh, buffered formalin. This is used for concentration only. Now, let's talk about the collection kits. Ano bang ginagamit natin for stool collection? Ideally, ideally, there should be three containers. The first one would contain formalin, 5 or 10%. This is used for concentration. Next is a PVA fixative for permanent staining. And a clean vial for unpreserved portion culture and assessment. Of course, you will be needing gloves and of course the other materials needed. Um, in, in consideration of the selection of a kit, of course, the, the vial size should be considered in order for us to allow for um, an adequate amount of sample. It should be child-proof. Di dapat mabuksan ng mga bata. There should be a steerer or a scoop for us to be assisted in getting the specimen into the vial and mixing it with the preservative. And this is very important, labeling. It should clearly indicate the presence of an poison and should be present in several languages. I think this is the label for the kit. And now, this is what I want to emphasize, the patient label information. Of course, it's very important that you um, put in the correct name, the date, and time of collection because these are very important things that you should consider because intervention will be done after diagnosing it. Magbibigay tayo ng gamot, ng procedure. Mamaya pala, iba na yung pinaggawan mo ng procedure kasi mali yung nakalagay na name sa specimen natin. Alright, and collection instructions. This is what I was telling you earlier. As a doctor, you should be able to explain properly how you're going, how the patient's going to collect the specimen. Okay? So, um, yeah, these are the things that we should remember in specimen collection. It, you should use clean container without urine or water. There is a minimum number of specimen required. So, uh, a series of three normally passed specimens is preferred. And for the frequency of collection, it should be collected on alternate days and never on the same day. So no laxative should be used or any other meds for that matter because they can mask infections or damage the organisms. And the date and time of collection should be a required information to be given. Now, there are techniques of stool examination. So una, gross examination, di ba? Okay, of course, titignan mo yan. Ano ba yung mga normal stool findings? So, in this picture, hair, yan, a muscle fiber, vegetable fiber, sperm, all those are normal stool findings, air bubble, and fat globule. So, what are we going to do when we are going to uh, do a gross examination of the stool? You have to grade the consistency of the specimen. So, merong Bristol stool chart. Merong type 1, type 2, so consistency lang niya, di ba? Hanggang maging watery na siya, type 7, entirely liquid. Decide on the best method of examination to allow for detecting most likely stages of parasites. And um, of course, upon gross examination, we should also look for worms. Uh, yung segments nila, and you have to remove this or separate them for identification purposes. And if present, Blood or mucus should be examined with wet mounts and permanent stains. So we have uh, techniques of stool examination. We have uh, direct wet mounts. This is used primarily to detect motility. So I want you to remember that class. For wet mounts, its main purpose is to detect motility. So fresh and preserved specimens are, are examined for motility. Preserved specimens are examined for organisms which do not concentrate well. For the procedure, we use a large slide and a cover slip and we'll mix a small amount of the specimen with a physiological saline and add a cover slip. So this is what we're going to do if we're going to check for the motility. For a stain prep preparation, on the other hand, in place of sal saline, use iodine stain or to reveal nuclear morphology. 
So, uh, for the density, at least you should be able to read newsprint through the smear. Pag ikaganan mo, may mababasa ka pa rin na letters uh, on a piece of paper uh, through the smear. Okay? How about wet mounts? So, stained wet mounts, these, uh, we use liquid specimens. They are more likely to contain trophozoites, sabi nga natin, kapag water use tool. So, buffered meth methylene blue may be used. Iodine is too harsh for trophozoites and it often damages morphology of the nucleus. Farm specimens are more likely to contain only the cyst. So, remember the inverted triangle that I've shown you earlier. Popular stains include uh, lugol solution like here. And then they do not make smears too thick and they examine them systematically. So for stool examination, we have what we call your concentration techniques. So here, upon doing the stool examination, we conduct qualitative techniques and quantitative techniques. Quantitative techniques would include your direct smear method, stool's dilution of egg count, and catocats technique. Well, for the qualitative technique, we will do both unconcentration technique and concentration technique. So unconcentration involves simple smear, while concentration technique has two types. It may use a flotation technique and a sedimentation technique. We're not, go, go, we're not going to uh, let, um, discuss on the details. But what I want you to understand here is that for flotation technique, or for concentration technique, it has uh, purposes. So first would be to reduce the background fecal debris. So lininisan siya. To increase relative number of the parasites and to preserve the morphology of the parasite. So this is an example of a fecal flotation technique or concentration. Now, there are also special stains that we need to remember. So for example, for pneumocystis carni, methanamine silver, gem shop, and periodic acid shift can be used to assess it. So it's, for example, in this picture, it shows us the cyst of pneumocystis gerovechi in Gemsha stain. We also have uh, Cryptosporidium parvum uh, using a modified acid fast stain examined with fluorescent microscopy. Immunoserologic detection, or what we also call um, parasitic serology tests. So this will, uh, these are test kits to detect presence of antigen organisms or antibody. So serology. Immuno, immunologic or serologic detection. So those detecting antigen are satisfa satisfactory but do not concentrate the amount of antigen present. Um, other procedures may demonstrate antigen as well and less expensively. Now we also have tests that measures the antibody. This includes your enzyme immunoassay, complement fixation, latex agglutination, direct and indirect immunofluorescence, indirect hemagglutination, bentonite flocculation, and immunoblot. So these are tests that checks on the antibody being present. And there are also procedures and testing that could improve. So we have um, standardization of antigens, reference reagents, and procedures would improve interpretation of results. Now, we have here our molecular methods. So, we have what we call your nucleic acid probes and molecular techniques. So, as we can see here, um, we have a probe preparation and a target preparation. So, upon preparation of the probe and then preparation of the targets, we have here at the end of the procedure, image analysis and data handling. So, nucleic acid probes and molecular techniques. This will help us detect malaria. Toxoplasmosis, amibiasis, leishmaniasis, and um, for epidemiologic purposes. Now, we also have what we call your quantitative worm egg count. So here, it is best used to estimate worm burden, kung gano'ng kadami siya, and must be performed on and preserved specimen. So preservatives will dilute the specimen. That's why we don't like it that it's going to be a preserved specimen. It will also eliminate the ability to calculate eggs per gram of the feces. Now, another uh, thing that we can use is the in vitro cultivation of parasites. So in vitro. 
It is primarily used for blood and tissue protozoa and it can culture for intestinal protozoa but not generally done due to time and sensitivity of test tissues. So as we can see here, um, the benefits would include a model for studying host-parasite interaction. It, it can be a source of immunomodulatory key molecules, in vitro testing of new drugs against schistosomiasis and alternative to animal experiments. Okay. Animal inoc inoculation. Ito naman nakakatawa tong strategy na to. So it's not routinely done because it's expensive and time-consuming. Also, it lacks sensitivity. So we can um, use this primarily for isolation of blood and tissue parasites. So for example, we have here what we call senodiagnosis. So what do we mean when we say senodiagnosis? So it's like a special case of animal inoculation. So for example, for Chagas disease, this human is um, affected of Chagas disease. So these um, vectors are healthy and they will be uh, exposed, exposing these vectors to the human skin. And then upon... Um, upon uh, them sucking blood on the human skin, we will check if these vectors will develop or will uh, there will be uh, parasites detected on these vectors already. So we call that seno diagnosis. Now we have other um, specimens that could be uh, tested. So we have your anal swabs, or we call this your scotch tape preparation. This is to detect for Enterobius vermicularis. So this is how it is being done. It must be collected in the morning prior to taking a bath or bowel movement. And, and um, can also be used for diagnosis of pinworm infections, but other helminth eggs can be seen also like uh, tania. So we'll just, using a scotch tape or an anal swab, you're going to um, uh, you're going to get a specimen from the anal opening. Um, we also have your muscle biopsies or other types of biopsy. Example for muscle biopsy, uh, under direct microscopic examination, we can see here trichinella spiralis cyst in a muscle tissue through a biopsy. Another would be intestinal or blood or mucosa biopsy or a direct microscopic examination for schistosoma. Now, another procedure for detecting blood parasite is the collection of blood samples. So, we may use a finger heel. Yan, sa finger. As you can see, it could be uh, taken from the lateral portion of the fingertips. This is preferred for, for thick and thin blood smears. It could be on the finger or the heel. So, you can see here. And then, it could be through the earlobe. I remember my experience when I had my duty at the Nico class. It's very difficult to... At least for me, it was very difficult to extract blood from a newborn, from a neonate, from someone who just had uh, been exposed to the extra uterine world. It's very difficult. So sometimes we resort to getting um, uh, pricks or uh, yun nga, finger, heel, and earlobe sticks. But majority, we use the fingertips and the heel. I have not tried earlobe sticks before, up to now actually. So add the samples. This is best if smear is made within one hour. So EDTA stands for ethylene diamine tetracetic acid. This is for chelation. So it is best to use if smear is made within one hour. So EDTA. Sodium citrate specimens, on the other hand, is used for larger amounts of blood to be used in concentration or cultivation. And we also have your clot tubes for ser serological procedures, and lets the clot retract. Now, for procedures detecting blood parasites, we also have what we call your um, blood sample wet mounts. So this is used for screening for motile organism organisms such as trypanosomes and filariae. Um, permanent stain smear, so we have different stains that we can use. Methylene blue eosin based. We also have your right stain, which is alcohol-based and cannot adjust pH, or a gem stain, which is water-based and can adjust to pH. So this is preferred for malaria examination. 
Now, um, lastly, we have your thick and thin blood films. Medyo kayo ni nata yung face ko. Okay, thick and thin blood films. Um, what's the difference between a thick and a thin smear for the blood parasites? For thick and thin blood films, they both detect malaria parasites, trypanosomes, and microfilariae. So it detects the same thing. But for preparation, it's quite different. So for thick blood films, we use three or four drops of blood stirred together to the size of a dime. And it must be hemoglobinized. Um, it must be hemoglobinized in buffered water prior to staining it with right stain. Uh, not necessary if using a gem stain. And no sprint, uh, just legible through the smear. So just legible. Okay lang naman. Nababasa mo din. Well, that of a thin smear glass, it is the same with that of a CBC differential. What's the advantage of a thick blood film? It will concentrate the blood and pick up light infections. While uh, for a thin blood film, it will allow for observation of infected red blood cell. Morphology of the organism is also seen better. Kasi thin nga yung smear natin. And the disadvantage for a thick blood film would be the infected red blood cells are lost and more experience is needed to recognize organisms and they must dry overnight before staining. So it takes much more time. While that of the thin blood film, it must, must examine for 30 minutes or 100 fields. Light infections may be missed. So those are the procedures for specimen collection. What are the fixatives that could be used and what are our procedures for um, our specimen? So let me end this lecture class by saying this. People who make a living of other people's fortunes or misfortunes are parasites. So as a medical student who's, who is learning to become a good doctor someday, class, do not be a parasite. Learn, learn on your own. Do not cheat. Take the exams on your own. And so that when the board exam comes, you're ready, you're prepared on your own. Okay, so that ends our lecture for today. See you on the next lecture. Thank you.